Mark Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, and he's widely known for his extensive modeling showing that the global economy could run on 100% wind, water, and solar energy by mid-century. So welcome to the interview, Mark. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Markham. This is fascinating, and this is a series of three. So uh, viewers, if you'll want to uh, tune in and watch the uh, second and third interviews as well. But why don't we, you, you've, this is a complex topic we're discussing in a short period of time here. So give us a kind of a condensed version of what your plan is. Well, we've developed plans for now 150 countries of the world, including Canada and all the major company, countries, to transition to 100% clean renewable energy and storage across all energy sectors. That's electricity, transportation, buildings, and industry primarily. Uh, so the idea is to electrify all energy or as much as possible. There's some direct heat and then provide the electricity and direct heat from clean renewable sources, namely onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal electricity, hydroelectricity, tiny amounts of tidal and wave electricity, and then some geothermal and solar heat. And so we'd have to electrify like transportation going primarily to battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell for long distance aircraft and ships, maybe some long distance trucks. Uh, and also there'll be um, for industry, we'll electrify industry with uh, electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters, electric heat pumps. We'd use fire bricks for storing high temperature heat. And when you do that, you can take intermittent wind and solar, for example, store that electricity as heat up to 2000 degrees Celsius for multiple days in these fire bricks. And these fire bricks can then replace a lot of the uh, electric heating technologies as well. Uh, for buildings, we instead of gas for air heating, for cooking, we'd use electric heat pumps for air heating, air conditioning, water heating. We'd use electric induction cooktops for stoves. And we'd electrify buildings, energy efficiency in buildings, LED lights. Um, so we'd provide the electricity and heat in all cases, as I mentioned, from clean renewable sources. And so we would eliminate all air pollution associated with energy, uh, all global warming emissions, including greenhouse gases and particles like black carbon and brown carbon uh, from energy. And we provide energy security uh, for the world. One of the things that strikes me is that we've been doing this 17 years now. We've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs and companies, that, you know, startups that are working in new clean energy technologies like, you know, heat batteries, that, that kind of thing. And what I remember, like when your plan first came out in 2017, in the intervening eight years, how much more technology there is than there was back then, how much more sophisticated and advanced and economic it is than it was back then. So... Did you get a lot of, you know, were there a lot of skeptics who looked at your plan and said, well, uh, that's not going to work because the technology isn't there and probably won't be there? Yeah. In fact, I'll even go back further. I mean, our very first energy plan was a kind of world plan, not country specific back in 2009. And at the time, you know, we said it was technically and economically possible to transition the whole world to 100% wind, water and solar for all energy purposes. Mm -hmm. The main obstacles are social and political, not technical or economic. And then, but people laughed at us and said, oh, it's pie in the sky, this will never happen. Uh, because they said, we can't even put 20% renewables on a grid without the grid going unstable. Well, back then we didn't have, you know, we just had the first electric cars, Tesla had a Roadster came out. Uh, we didn't have stationary batteries to any extent at all. Uh, we didn't have, uh, we, we had the electric heat pumps, but not on a massive scale. We, but, and then went fast forward to 2017, uh, when we did our first country by country plans, uh, there was still skepticism that we couldn't keep the grid stable with, like, except it went up from 20% by then up to 80%. They thought people said, oh, well, we can do it up to 80%, but we can't go any higher than 80%. Kind of an arbitrary limit, both of them were. I mean, subsequently we found, and there are other people have confirmed that, you know, you can go up to 100% renewables in a grid and keep the grid stable. So that's not a limit. But the technologies that have come along since then, certainly batteries, battery electric vehicles have jumped up. Uh, electric heat pumps have become the norm rather than the exception. Uh, we have some new electricity generating technologies that are coming around now, like enhanced geothermal. Before, like in the US, we could, there were only 13 states where you can uh, act, drill for geothermal electricity because you need certain temperatures. But now with deep geothermal, you can pretty much do it anywhere, most 80% you know, of places. 
and you can produce electricity that's becoming commercialized. Uh, fire brick storage, we didn't have that before, which are bricks that you can store heat for industrial processes up to very high temperatures and for per long periods of time, like a week to two weeks. And so those are new technologies. Hydrogen has also jumped as well in terms of you know, fuel cells and advanced hydrogen. I think this is a point that's not well taken, but we kind of we make it all the time here at Energy Media. And that is, we're not just in an energy transition, we're in a techno technological revolution. And depending on who you talk to, this might be the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth or the sixth or whatever, but clearly uh, this is, uh, there are technologies in other fields and it might be materials, it could be software like AI, it could be, that then impinge upon the energy space. And, it, you know, making those connections, seeing the Venn diagrams of how all of these technologies overlap and empower one another is really something. And do you find that that idea just isn't well understood? Yeah, there are lots of interactions that, and other technologies that can help energy. But I mean, I think we, in terms of actually solving the problem, I think we, you know, we have the solutions, we know what the solutions are, and we have the technologies. Well, we have 97% of the technologies we need to go to 100% renewable across all energy sectors worldwide. The key is to deploy, deploy, deploy on a massive scale. So it's not, I don't think it's so critical to kind of research what's all well, these, these interactions. They're occurring kind of naturally uh, and they're pretty complex to kind of go into here. But yeah, they're, they're helpful. Anything that can help deploy and advance the technologies is great, but really what we need is political willpower at this point, because we need to solve 80% of the problem by 2030 and 100% by 2035 to 40. Uh, otherwise, you know, the problems that we're seeing right now in terms of air pollution deaths and climate damage are just going to increase and energy security problems as well. Let's talk about political will for a minute, because what we're saying, we, I mean, you uh, are uh, down in uh, uh, the Northern California. And so in the United States, you've now got the Trump administration, which is rolling back all of the Biden uh, clean energy policies and, and programs, at least as much as it can. And putting uh, the U.S., uh, you know, light, it's now lagging further and further behind China all the time. And all that it takes is political will, political understanding. And yet in so many of the Western countries, that is not the case. And I include Canada in, in that, even though we've got Mark Carney as prime minister, you know, Mr. Climate Finance. And is it just, are we just going to have to uh, accept the fact that, that some countries and some political leaders are going to be innovators at the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the curve and some are going to be laggards at the other end and we just have to work through that process? Uh, kind of, but well, yeah, first of all, there are countries that are going very fast. China is extremely fast. In fact, they've put up more renewable energy in the first five months of this year, wind and solar. They put up as close to 250 gigawatts in just five months. That's going to be over 500 gigawatts in a year. Uh, I calculate that at that pace, they will be 100% renewable across all energy sectors if they electrify all energy by 2038 which is outstanding. They're the largest emitters in the world, the largest energy consumers in the world, and the largest polluters in the world with over a million, close to a million and a half deaths per year from air pollution. And that, that can all be a, something of the past if they go at the same pace of transition. And hopefully that will shame other countries into transitioning fast as well. There are actually on the order of 20 other countries that are actually going really fast like China and will also meet 100% renewables across all energy sectors if they keep up their current pace by before 2040. And But the US, for example, has slowed down. We were kind of speeding up, but now just this year we're slowing down and it's gonna take till 2120 or so to get to 100% renewables at the current pace from this year. Last year it was 20 by 2070 to 2080. Uh, so we do, it's political willpower, but you know, Individual, even though a country might not be doing it, individual states or provinces can do things like California is actually further ahead than China or in the electric power sector uh, than any other country in the world. We're on over almost 60% renewables for such a large uh, region, 60% uh, wind, water, solar uh, so far this year. Uh, there are some states in the U.S. that are actually at 100%, but they're really small, like South Dakota in the last year was 121% wind, water, solar on its electric power grid. Now that's not all energy, but that's electric power. 
But point is, individual states can set policies and like Trump has repealed subsidies, as California and other states can actually add subsidies to renewables to promote them. So it's not dead in the water just because the federal government doesn't do things. Uh, hopefully, these states will also start taxing and taking away subsidies from fossil fuel companies to do the same thing that because we need to get rid of fossil fuels. They are uh, causing death and illness. They're causing land devastation. They're causing prices to be high. Fossil fuels are the problem. They are, are the problem now. They are causing huge prices and also death and, and morbidity uh, throughout not only the U.S. but the world. Seven and a half million people die every year from air pollution from fossil fuels and biofuels. What do you make of this argument? Because this is our position at uh, Energy Media. We don't talk about climate. And the reason we don't talk about climate, and I don't know what it's like in the United States, but in Canada, as soon as you in introduce the issue of climate, it becomes a moral issue. Well, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. Whereas when you're talking about technology change, market change, uh, and um, uh, lower costs, that sort of thing, that changes the conversation. It becomes, it goes from being, well, I, I believe or don't believe, to it is inevitable because cheaper technology, better technology always displaces uh, other, the older technology. And I don't know, what do you make of that argument? Well, I agree that it's not necessary to talk about climate. In fact, I don't you know, most people, there are a lot of people don't believe in climate change. But the thing is, there's a public opinion poll uh, in the last few years where they ask, you know, how, how many people, what percentage of people or they ask people individually, do you believe in the transition to 100% renewable energy? And it turned out 82% of people, and this was across 11 countries, like 26,000 people, believed in 100% renewable energy. But only about, like, it was only around, I think it was 60% of people believed in climate change. Which is fine if you believe in the solution, but don't believe in the problem. It's fine with me. And you, you know, the goal is to solve the problem, and you don't have to believe in the problem if you believe in renewable energy. But the interesting thing is, well, why do they believe in 100% renewable energy? Uh, because it creates jobs, because it allows people to own their own energy, uh, it reduces international reliance, reliance on international trade for energy, uh, it can lower prices, and also for a lot of people it reduces air pollution too. So you don't have to believe in climate change to believe in all the other benefits of renewable energy. So I agree that it's not necessary to talk about climate when we're talking about a transition renewables. We wanna do transition renewables for a lot of other reasons aside from climate change. Mark, let's finish this interview with this question. And you're a professor of engineering. Do you see, do you think that we have essentially solved all of the technological issues that are required. I know you said earlier we have all the technology, but there's other in issues like integration and and so on. But have we solved all of them, or are we very close to solving these technological problems? Yeah, well, we have about 97% of the technologies we need. I mean, the main technologies we don't have commercial, that is, are long distance aircraft, long distance ships. But you know, hydrogen fuel cells have potential there. We already have battery electric aircraft for short distance, short haul flights, and short distance boats and ships. Um, but in terms of grid, I mean, yeah, there are there are 12 countries that run 100% renewable grids, and most of them are dominated by hydropower. Uh, you know, there's some subtle details with solar, you know, if you have a huge solar dominated grid or a huge wind dominated grid, which we do, I mean, South Dakota is running on 90% wind. I mean, it's also got 30% hydro and 3% solar and some gas and coal. So it's over 100% of its demand is met with wind, water, solar, and it's part of a larger grid. So it manages to keep stable. So that, but a lot of these solutions, as we increase the renewable penetrations on the grid, a lot of these solutions are fixed on the job, so to speak, as you know, people say, oh, here's a, here's a problem. We can fix that this way. You know, they come up with the solutions as you're moving along. So these are not, uh, these are not problems that can't be overcome. Um, so I'm not, you know, there are, I would say, no, there are not technologies that are not easily readily available to solve all the problems we have. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. And uh, viewers, uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first of three interviews. And I encourage you to take a look at the uh, interviews number two and three as well. So Mark, thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Mark.